in the sense of there being a linguistic grid, a language structure grid, which we impose a priori, as it were, on actual sensibility, uh, with the result that the way in which uh, one language sees the world is going to be different from another. There is a relativity of different constructions, and none of them can be taken as identical with the real world. Now, what this boils down to is by virtue of the fact that our languages structure the world of experience, we do not know reality in itself. Anti-realism is the result. Now, it's that kind of structuralism which was the springboard for developments in philosophy of language and linguistic theory in Europe, in the phenomenological tradition, uh, and in this country, in analytic philosophy. In Europe, it's from that sort of background that um, Derrida, the deconstructionist, comes. What is deconstruction? Well, it's undoing what the structuralist says we have structured. Uh, what Derrida, the deconstructionist, is doing, you see, is trying to deconstruct the verbal schemes which a writer builds to show that that really doesn't work completely, or that there are a variety of languages there that work inconsistently. Uh, it is our language that dominates our world of experience and keeps us from seeing it and talking about it in other ways than we might. And so the relativity is extended in that regards. Now, I mentioned the name of Chomsky, the structural linguistic. Um, the difference with Chomsky is that he's much more Kantian in that he thinks there is a universal, in-depth, structure shared by all languages, you see, a universal depth structure. In addition to this kind of surface structure, as he calls it, which the Saussure seems to be talking about. But the deconstructionist sees no depth structure. So it's all surface structure, stuff that we've built. Well, um, you can understand what um, uh, the structuralist is saying, I think, if you hear, uh, oh yes, some of your um, friends around here talking um, their languages as distinct from yours. Uh, the musician talks of the language of music. And if you tune in closely, I think that's the appropriate metaphor, if you tune in closely to musicians, uh, you'll notice that there is a different language in, shall we say, classical music uh, than there is in um, uh, some very contemporary music. You'll see. Different languages. Uh, the same is true with science. Different language in Aristotelian science from Newtonian science, so forth. Um, now, that sort of um, variability is picked up in the analytic tradition by Nelson Goodman. Nelson Goodman, who, um, yes, is a nominalist in the Quine tradition, denies this um, business of um, structuring our worlds of experience to philosophy of science. So that science is simply um, dealing with language constructs. A scientific theory is just a language. Now that's not new, we heard Ernst Marx say that. 
When, uh, when Marx said that a scientific theory is just an economical way for describing the relationships between sense data. An economical way. Well, there are various economical ways of doing it. So there can be various scientific languages, alternative scientific theories. You see. And these alternative scientific languages are not intertranslatable. They're not intertranslatable. Or, to, uh, to use the, uh, the technical term, they are incommensurable. You cannot measure one by the other. They're incommensurable languages. And yet they're equally sound, equally viable. Now, there's some influence here from Thomas Kuhn with his structure of scientific revolutions, you see. Uh, Kuhn, who has uh, recognized that with paradigm shifts you get, as Goodman would say, a new language, a new way of structuring things. Well, the, these um, alternative scientific languages are due then to the fact that you can link up the sense qualities in different ways. Uh, you know those um, um, follow the dots, follow the number puzzles, where you um, trace the numbers from 1 to 103 and come out with some animal picture that you've outlined that way. Um, uh, it's as if science is doing that sort of thing, except that the um, numbers aren't given, and so you can link them up in all sorts of different ways and make sense of the overall picture. Alternative ways of structuring it. So that our theories and general concepts in science are symbols, not descriptions. They are symbols rather than like artistic symbols and Nelson Goodman has written in aesthetic theory. In aesthetic theory where he sees a work of art as a creative language structuring certain things, you see. The worlds of art created in science similarly. Well, the outcome, you say, is that um, he's going to be a relativist and a phenomenalist. Yes, indeed. He has a phenomenalist view of science. Um, there's really no such thing as a true theory. Um, you can accept a picture as being correct. You can accept several pictures as being correct. You can link the dots up in different ways. A correct scientific picture is one that um, covers the scope of data. It has adequate scope. It's coherent, it's um, logically consistent, and it hangs together in a unified fashion. It um, enables you to talk about the data in uh, simple rather than unnecessarily complicated ways, principle of parsimony. And um, you can... Um, infer things from it that are fruitful for further hypotheses and experimentation. So um, his philosophy of science uh, goes that way. Now, the person who in philosophy of science has taken it um, to the relativist extreme is a man named Feyerabend. Uh, Feyerabend, who um, is much less given to talking about a correct picture or pictures and is very blunt about the relativity of all scientific knowledge. Um, and this um, anti-realism is one of the things in, this anti-realism in philosophy of science is one of the things that feeds into the um, uh, postmodernism of Richard Rorty. Richard Rorty, in his um, now famous book on philosophy and the mirror of nature. Philosophy and the mirror of nature. The mirror, you recall, is the subjective ideas in the mind that John Locke talks about, representational. And what he is doing is. Um, 
insisting on the failure of that representational theory of knowledge and the foundationalism with which it was associated, the relativity of all of our structures of ideas, complex concepts, scientific theories, so that he sees philosophy not as giving us access to the truth at all about things in themselves, but as simply a conversation uh, that has pragmatic value, but um, uh, there's really no intertranslatability of various languages and structures. Richard Broughty. Well, in um, uh, contrast to, um, let's see, in contrast to Nelson Goodman is the work of Hilary Putman at Harvard. Hilary Putman, who um, uh, is quick to grant that alternative constructs are certainly possible, and that scientific theories, of course, are subject to revision. In other words, he's rejecting foundationalism. But he still wants scientific theories to be taken realistically. And he insists that our constructs are not just conventional ways of talking. He wants to be a realist. Now, how does he justify that? He justifies it by saying that we have firm knowledge of certain observations and material entities. There are observations and material entities that are firmly known. In other words, there are given data. And within those, he includes things like electrons and force fields and spatial magnitudes. Okay? The sorts of things that all scientists observe and measure regardless of their theoretical constructs. So that um, the frameworks that we build, the theoretical structures may be tentative, but they're intended to be statements about reality. Whitehead's provisional realism about science. Putnam wants science to be taken realistically in a provisional way. Now, within these known points of reference that he talks about are not only um, electrons, force fields, but also certain natural kinds, certain natural kinds of things. In other words, there are classifications that are objective. Classification is not simply our language structuring something. There are objective categories of things, objective kinds, species if you like. And there are general laws that we recognize whatever the language. In this sense there are logical entities. There are logical objects, objects of thought, not just 